Okay, so welcome to this video. In this video, what we're going to talk about is cholesterol metabolism. Okay, so let me give you an overview of the structure then for this video. We're going to start off with a basic discussion of what cholesterol actually is, and then we're going to discuss what it's actually used for in the body. Okay, so why does the body need cholesterol? And we'll talk about two main uses of cholesterol. So we'll talk about the fact that it's an essential component of the cell membranes, okay? We'll also talk about the fact that we use it for synthesizing bile salts, okay? Then what we'll go on to is having an overview of how cholesterol is transported around the body, okay? Uh, so we'll look at how dietary cholesterol is first transported to the liver, then how uh, the liver can put cholesterol into the LDL pooled within the blood, okay? We'll then look at how uh, Cholesterol can be taken out of the uh, LDL pool within the blood by liver cells and by peripheral cells that need more cholesterol. Okay, we'll talk about how cholesterol can also be synthesized in liver cells and also peripheral cells. Okay, and we'll talk about how peripheral cells can add cholesterol back into the LDL pool by a mechanism known as reverse cholesterol transport. Okay, then after we've discussed that, what we will discuss is a, a basic overview of what lipoproteins are, because that's the essential sort of foundational knowledge for understanding cholesterol transport around the body, okay, because in the blood, the cholesterol is transported in lipoproteins. We'll start by discussing what lipoproteins are, and then we'll discuss how cells control the amount of cholesterol within them, okay, so we'll discuss cellular cholesterol homeostasis, so we'll discuss how liver cells and peripheral cells are capable of synthesizing cholesterol. We'll discuss the SREBP pathway, which is a way of regulating the amount of cholesterol in the cell. Okay, so that's a way of um, turning on uh, cholesterol synthesis and also uh, the absorption of cholesterol from the blood, from the LDL pool within the blood, if cholesterol is too low within the cell. Then we'll move on to discuss what happens if cholesterol is too high within the cell. That's where it differs between uh, liver cells and peripheral cells. Okay, so we'll see how peripheral cells can uh, put cholesterol back into uh, the blood for this process called reverse cholesterol transport. And we'll see how liver cells, if they have too much cholesterol, really what they do is they just turn it into more bile salts, basically. Okay, then uh, finally what we'll talk about, oh well, actually not finally, uh, we'll then talk about um, the movement of cholesterol from the intestine to the liver, so that's something called the exogenous pathway. Okay, and then we'll discuss how the liver can put cholesterol uh, into the blood through the endogenous pathway. Okay, then finally what we'll talk about is hypercholesterolemia, how it can lead to atherosclerosis, and we'll end by discussing anti-atherosclerotic drugs. Okay, right, so that's an overview of the structure then for this video. So we're going to start off with a very basic question then, which is, what actually is cholesterol? Okay, so, uh, I want to draw out then the structure of cholesterol. Now, before we can draw out the structure of cholesterol, we need to know what a sterol actually is. And in order to understand what a sterol actually is, you need to know what a steroid is. So, we're firstly going to start off with the structure of a steroid. Then we'll progress to the structure of a sterol, okay? And then finally, we'll have a look at what cholesterol actually is. Okay, right, so what is a steroid? Well, this is something that people generally find surprising when they learn for the first time, because people expect steroids to be defined uh, by their biological action. That's the way uh, steroids are implied to be defined in popular culture, i.e. they're molecules that have very powerful biological actions. But in fact, steroid molecules are chemical definitions. Okay, it's a chemical definition, not a biological definition. Okay, so if all steroid molecules contain a certain structure, okay, the steroid structure, 
Now I'm going to draw out the steroid structure and I'm going to draw it in a skeletal formula rather than molecular formula because if you draw it in skeletal formula it's incredibly simple the picture that you have to draw, okay? Uh, whereas if you draw it in molecular formula the picture ends up looking very intimidating. Okay, right, so remember, in skeletal formula, you don't show carbon atoms. They are implicitly shown by corners, okay, and by junctions. You, in addition, don't show hydrogen atoms coming off carbon atoms. When a carbon atom has missing bonds coming off it, those bonds are implicitly to hydrogen atoms, basically. Okay, now that makes the picture of the skeletal structure of a steroid uh, molecule extremely simple because steroid structure consists just of carbon atoms with hydrogen atoms coming off those carbon atoms, which means that the structure looks incredibly simple if we draw it in its skeletal formula. Okay, so let me draw this here. Okay, so basically the steroid structure is four carbon rings attached to one another. Three of these carbon rings are six carbon rings, so here is one of these six-membered carbon rings. Okay, then here's a second one, and here's the third one. And then the final carbon ring, uh, the fourth carbon ring, is going to be um, a five-membered ring rather than a six-membered ring. So here comes the fourth ring, which is a five-membered ring over here. So a pentagon rather than a hexagon. Okay, right. Uh, so that basically is um, the skeletal formula for a steroid molecule. I said it was very, very simple. Okay, and it is so simple because all that it consists of is carbon atoms linked to carbon atoms, and then wherever you've got missing bonds off those carbon atoms, those are just hydrogen atoms. Okay, now, uh, people name the rings of the steroid structure um, with letters, basically. Okay, so this first ring here, this is known as ring num letter A, rather, I was about to say number A. Uh, this second ring is ring C. This third ring is ring, sorry, the second ring is ring B. The third ring is ring C, okay? And the fourth ring over here is ring D. Okay, so those are the names of the four rings of the steroid structure, okay? Uh, now, I should stress that all steroid molecules, all molecules that are considered steroids, will contain something similar to this. They'll contain these four rings, okay? Uh, they'll have modifications to it, though. They might have a few double bonds here and there, and they'll have certainly a lot of other things attached off uh, the carbon atoms. But this is the basic starting point if you want to build a steroid molecule. Okay, right. The next thing I want to tell you about is how the carbons of the steroid structure are numbered. Okay, so basically there are 17 carbons in this steroid structure and they're all given a number from 1 to 17. So let me show you how they're numbered. So this one in ring A up here, this is the one that we start with and we call that number 1. Okay, and then we start going around anti-clockwise. So we'll call this one number 2 this one number three, this one number four, this one number five, and then we jump into ring B here. This one's called number six, this one's number seven, this one's number eight here, this one's number nine, this one's number ten, and then we've got to a dead end. Okay, so we jump back to here then. Okay, this one's called number eleven, this one's called number twelve, this one's called number thirteen, we go down to here, this one's called number 14, this one's called number 15, this one's called number 16, and this one's called number 17. So if you like, it's the best we could do, really. It's a nice path. Okay, right. Uh, so those that's the way that we number up the carbons, then, of the steroid structure. Okay, so that's a little bit of background information about steroid structures then, but we want to know what a sterol is now. So how do you turn a steroid into a sterol? Okay, well again, uh, all sterol molecules, of which cholesterol is an example, are going to contain this basic sterol structure. And a sterol is extremely similar to a steroid. Okay, it's a steroid with one little modification. Okay, and that's that you're going to add in an alcohol group at a certain position. Okay, and that's why you've put the O there, uh, denoting the alcohol group. Okay, so basically, the alcohol group in a sterile molecule is put off 
this third carbon here. So to turn the steroid structure into a sterol molecule, all we need to do is take one hydrogen off that third carbon there, of the steroid structure, and instead replace it with an alcohol group here. And now the structure that we've got there is the basic foundational structure that all sterol molecules contain. Okay, so all sterols are steroids because they contain the basic steroid structure. Okay, but of course not all um, steroids are going to be steroids. Okay, right. Uh, so now let's have a look at a specific example of a sterol, which is the one that we're uh, talking about for the entire video, which is cholesterol. Okay, right. So now what I want to show you is how do you have to modify the core sterol structure to turn it into uh, cholesterol. Okay, so there are four modifications that you have to make, and before I uh, tell you what these are, I'll just redraw out the basic sterol structure. So here is ring A here. Here is ring B, the second uh, six-membered carbon ring here. Here is ring C here. And then we'll have ring D here. Okay, so now let's see the modifications. Oh, whoops, missed off the alcohol group. That's the steroid structure. Let's put that alcohol group on because we want the sterile structure. Okay, so what modifications then are we going to make? Okay, well, uh, first what I'll tell you about is that we're going to add two methyl groups onto two of the carbons of this sterile structure. Okay, specifically, we're going to add a methyl group onto carbon number 10 here. Okay, between ring A and ring B. Okay, and also on carbon number 13 here between ring C and ring D. Okay, so both of those carbons, they would in the pure sterile structure have hydrogens coming off because they have three bonds to other carbon atoms. Okay, and that fourth bond will be to a hydrogen atom. We're going to take those hydrogen atoms off those carbons and instead stick methyl groups coming off. Okay, like so. So here are some of the first modifications we've made. So I'll colour in the modifications in turquoise. So basically, when you show methyl groups in a skeletal formula, they look, again, very simple because this is the new carbon that you've added on. And then, of course, you don't show the free hydrogens coming off that carbon. Okay, so you literally just show it as a line coming off like that. Okay, and those are denoting methyl groups coming off uh, those two carbons. Okay, so that's two modifications down. We want the other two now. Okay, next one I'll tell you about, which is another simple one, which is we're going to turn this bond between carbon number five and carbon number six here from being a single bond to being a double bond. Okay, so carbon number five will have one hydrogen coming off it. Carbon number six will have two hydrogens coming off it. You're going to take a hydrogen of carbon five and one hydrogen of carbon number six, and you're going to instead make a new covalent bond between carbon five and carbon six, making that bond between them now a double bond. Okay, so that's our third modification. And then our final modification is we're going to stick a great big eight carbon side chain off carbon 17 up here. Okay, so let me show you this. And again, this has a kind of beautiful symmetry. So here's carbon number one of this side chain. Here's carbon number two, carbon number three, carbon number four, carbon number five, carbon number six, carbon number seven, and then carbon number eight is going to come off here. Okay, so there's our eight carbon side chain that we've now stuck onto the side of the cholesterol molecule. So this is one great big modification that we've made here. And you can kind of see the beautiful symmetry uh, that that side chain has there. Okay, right. And that's the fourth and final modification that we've made to the basic sterile structure to convert it into cholesterol. And this molecule that we now have sitting in front of us is the complete cholesterol molecule. And it's this molecule that we will be studying throughout this entire video. Okay, so before we go any further, let me just tell you about uh, a core key property of cholesterol molecules, basically. Okay, uh, which we're going to need to be able to understand uh, how these molecules are used uh, in the body. Okay, so one of the absolutely key properties of cholesterol is that it is an amphipathic molecule. Okay, so what is meant by amphipathic? Okay, so basically amphipathic means that you have a polar portion and then a hydrophobic portion. Okay, so the meaning of amphipathic is that you have both a polar portion 
and also a hydrophobic portion. Now, in the case of cholesterol, most of the molecule is hydrophobic, and it has a tiny, tiny little polar portion, but it still does have a polar portion, okay, so it is uh, amphipathic. Okay, so let's just uh, discuss which portion is the polar portion and which portion is the hydrophobic portion. I suppose really we should discuss what polar and hydrophobic actually mean. Okay, so um, a polar uh, molecule or a polar group is one where you do not have equal charge distribution, basically. Okay, uh, so uh, to give an example of a really polar molecule, we could have water. Okay, so I'll draw a water molecule here. Uh, so, basically, in these two covalent bonds between like, the oxygen atom and hydrogen atoms, okay, uh, you have two electrons. And uh, the electrons are not in, this, in these bonds actually sitting directly in between the oxygen and the hydrogen atom. Instead, the electrons in both of these bonds uh, sit slanted towards the oxygen atom, basically, because oxygen has a greater electronegativity than hydrogen, which means that the tendency of the oxygen nucleus to pull electrons towards it is greater than the strength of the hydrogen nucleus pulling electrons towards it. So so these electrons end up slanted towards the oxygen, and basically you end up with a partial negative charge at the end of the oxygen molecule, okay, and then partial positive charges at the ends of the hydrogen uh, molecules, okay, or hydrogen atoms rather. Okay, so that's what is meant by polar, that you've got this uneven uh, distribution of charge, you've got effectively a negative pole and a positive pole, okay. Now, um, this alcohol group that we've got here in the cholesterol molecule, this is polar. Oxygen, again, has a much higher electronegativity than hydrogen. We know that from water, but also than carbon, okay? So the oxygen pulls the electrons towards it and ends up with a partial negative charge, very similar to what we have in water, okay? So this is our little glimpse of polarity in this great structure. Okay, right. The rest of this huge great structure is extremely hydrophobic. It doesn't interact well with water. Okay, and the reason that it doesn't interact well with water is because the structure is incredibly neutral. Okay, neutral molecules do not interact well with polar molecules such as water. Okay, so why is this structure so neutral? Well, because you've got carbon atoms bound to carbon atoms, okay, and carbon atoms bound to hydrogen atoms, and those are the only bonds really that you've got in this entire structure, okay, and both of those bonds are non polar, okay. Uh, carbon has the same electronegativity, obviously, than, as carbon, so the electrons sit right in the middle and neither ends up with a partial charge. Carbon and hydrogen roughly have the same electronegativity, so again, the electrons in this bond end up in the middle, okay, and therefore that bond is not polar. So this vast structure that we've got here in cholesterol, all of this, which is just made out of carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms bound to one another, is non-polar, basically. It's very, very neutral. You've got a nice, even distribution of charge, and therefore it doesn't interact well with water. So this is the great big hydrophobic portion, and then we've got a glimpse of polarity there at one end, basically. Okay, so that is why it's called an amphipathic molecule. You've got a hydrophobic portion, which is the huge portion, and then you've got a a glimpse of polarity, a little flash of polarity at this little end here. Okay, right, so that's our answer to what cholesterol is. We now know the structure of cholesterol, and we know this key chemical property of cholesterol, which is that it is amphipathic. It has one portion that will interact beautifully with water, and indeed we could call this hydrophilic, okay, but polar would be a more normal uh, word to use to describe it, okay. And then we've got this huge hydrophobic or neutral portion that's not going to interact well with water. Okay, right, uh, so what we now want to discuss is the uses then for the cholesterol, okay? So what does the body actually use cholesterol for? Why is it necessary for the body to actually have uh, cholesterol? Okay, and there's two main uses of cholesterol that I'm going to talk about. The first is that it's used in cell membranes, and the second use I want to talk about is that it's used to produce bile salts, basically. Okay, so let's start by talking about cell membranes. Okay, so 
I want to start by discussing uh, the main component of cell membranes, which are phospholipids. Okay, because we're actually going to uh, see a lot of phospholipids in this video. Okay, they're going to be another core component of the lipoproteins, uh, which are the means by which we're going to transport cholesterol around. So we might as well discuss phospholipids now. Okay, right. Uh, so basically, hopefully you know that cell membranes are a bilayer. Okay, and they're a bilayer mainly of phospholipids. Okay, so let me discuss what a phospholipid actually is. What is the definition then of a phospholipid? Okay, so to be a phospholipid, you only need to obey uh, two criteria, basically. And two criteria are that you need a phosphate group, okay, somewhere within your structure. Okay, and you also need some sort of group which is lipidy. Okay, now what does lipidy actually mean? Okay, well, it's equivalent to hydrophobic. Hydrophobic and lipid are the same sort of description, basically. Okay, uh, lipid molecules are molecules that are hydrophobic. They're molecules which don't interact well with water. Okay, so very, very neutral structure. Okay. Right, so these are the two uh, features that you need. Now, I should stress that these phospholipids, therefore, are also going to be examples of amphipathic, sorry, amphipathic uh, molecules, okay? Uh, because the phospho phosphate group is going to be very polar, okay? That's going to have uh, real charges, we'll see in a moment, okay? Whereas uh, the lipid group is going to be extremely non-polar, it's going to be very neutral, okay? And therefore, this mo these molecules are also going to be uh, amphipathic. Okay, so that's the only two criterion then that you need to obey in order to be considered a phospholipid. You need a phosphate group and you need a lipid group. Okay, now, I'm going to show you an example, the main example of a phospholipid which is involved in um, producing the phospholipid by there, okay? Uh, and then I'll show you uh, one of the little cartoon pictures that we're going to use throughout this video to denote phospholipids. Okay, so first thing I want to show you one of the absolutely core phospholipids that is used to build phospholipid by there's. Okay, and this is the example of a molecule called lecithin, okay? Uh, now, lecithin has a more uh, longer name, okay, which is phosphatidylcholine, okay? And sometimes you'll see phosphatidylcholine abbreviated down to PC, okay? Now, really, phosphatidyl and choline should be together, but I didn't think I could squeeze choline in there. Okay, so it should all be one great word. Okay, so I want to now show you a cartoon structure then of phosphatidylcholine or lecithin as it's also called. Okay, so basically, um, phosphatidylcholine is based on the structure of a molecule called phosphatidic acid. So the first thing that we need to discuss is what actually is phosphatidic acid, and then we can move on to. Oops, no, not that's fine. Phosphatidic acid, and then we can move on to what phosphatidylcholine actually is. Okay, so phosphatidic acid has as its basis a glycerol molecule. So glycerol is at the center of phosphatidic acid, and then everything else is stuck off this glycerol molecule. So let me show it here on its side. Okay, right. So I'll draw the picture out and then I'll explain it. Okay, so here and like so. So this is my cartoon then for phosphatidic acid. Okay, right, so let me now label up the components of this. So this vertical line that I have now coloured in in green here, whoops, uh, this is representing glycerol, okay? And uh, glycerol has another name, okay? Glycerol is its old biochemist name. The more modern chemist name for glycerol is propane-1,2,3-triol. Okay, and although propane one two three trial is obviously much more of a mouthful than glycerol, it's a more useful name uh, because it tells us exactly what this molecule actually is. It tells us that it's a free carbon molecule, that's the propane, where you have alcohol groups coming off the first, the second, and the third carbon of that uh, propane molecule. 
Okay, so if you like, this portion up here is representing the first carbon, this portion in the middle is the second carbon, and this portion down here is the third carbon, and every single one of these carbons has a single alcohol group coming off. Okay, and we're going to attach additional things onto these alcohol groups to produce us phosphatidic acid. Okay, so onto the alcohol group that comes off the first and the second carbons, Okay, we have attached these horizontal lines, which I've now uh, coloured in in orange, and these are representing long-chain carboxylic acids, okay? And people also call long-chain carboxylic acids fatty acids, okay? So you might also hear these called fatty acids, okay? Now, um, what actually is then a long-chain carboxylic acid? Well, the name, again, tells us exactly what it actually is. It's a carboxylic acid molecule that has a really, really long hydrophobic tail, basically. Okay, and this hydrophobic tail then is a lipid molecule, hence why uh, these carboxylic acid molecules are called fatty acids. Fatty is the other, uh, even more colloquial word meaning lipidy, basically. Okay, right, so what effectively you have is if I just draw this here, is you have your carboxylic acid group, like so, and then you have a really long hydrophobic tail here, which is the lipid portion, okay? And we have then bound this carboxylic acid group to the alcohol group coming off the glycerol molecule by an ester link, basically. Okay, right, then, um, off the alcohol group that comes off the third carbon here, we have attached a phosphate group, okay? So this purple blob here, this is representing a phosphate group that has been attached onto uh, the alcohol group that comes off the uh, third carbon of the glycerol molecule, basically. Okay, now if I show you the structure of a phosphate group, basically it consists of a phosphorus atom with an oxygen atom double bound to it. Then the phosphorus atom has two alcohol groups coming off it. Okay, and then finally it has an oxygen atom uh, with a negative charge attached to it, so an oxygen atom that's singly bound to the phosphate group, and which has then acquired an electron via ionic means to make up its full eight outer shell electrons, and therefore has this negative charge. Okay, so this is our phosphate group here. Okay, right. Now we have then attached the phosphate group onto the alcohol group in a way very similar to how you would attach a carboxylic acid group onto an alcohol group. In fact, if you look at this sort of group here, if I just highlight this here, that actually looks incredibly similar to a carboxylic acid group here. Okay, if that phosphorus atom was a carbon atom, then it would be a carboxylic acid group. And indeed, this can react with alcohol groups in a very analogous way to the way that carboxylic acid groups can react with alcohol groups. Okay, so you form something almost identical to an ester link, but it's called a phosphoester link. Okay, right, so that's how you've attached the phosphate group onto the alcohol group that comes off the third carbon of the glycerol molecule. Okay, and this molecule that we have now created here, this is phosphatidic acid, okay, and it is a phospholipid, okay, it has the two criteria met, okay, it's got a phosphate group over here, okay, that's the purple portion, and then it's got lipid groups, it's got two of them here, okay, so it meets the criteria to be a phospholipid, and indeed you do have a little bit of phosphatidic acid within the phospholipid by there, okay, but as I say, the main phospholipid that makes up the phospholipid by there is lecithin, okay, and lecithin is going to be a modified version of phosphatidic acid. So what you're going to do now is you're going to attach another molecule onto this phosphate group of the phosphatidic acid. Okay, so let me show this like so. Okay, so let me at first discuss what molecule we're actually going to add on. We're going to add on a molecule called choline. Okay, now choline is the same molecule as you find in acetylcholine, the very uh, famous neurotransmitter. Okay, there the choline, which is an alcohol molecule, has been esterified onto an acetic acid molecule to create acetylcholine. Here what we're going to do is attach the alcohol group of the choline molecule onto this remaining alcohol group of the phosphate group. So this alcohol group has been involved in the binding of, uh, to the glycerol molecule here, but now we've got this remaining alcohol group here, which can bind uh, to the alcohol group, the choline molecule, again via a phosphorus to link. Okay, so what we can create, therefore, 
is phosphatidyl phosphatidylcholine here, which will have uh, this choline molecule, which I'll just represent as a rectangle here, attached off the phosphatidic acid molecule. Okay, so here's the phosphate group of the phosphatidic acid molecule. Here's the glycerol molecule of the phosphatidic acid molecule. Here are the two long chain carboxylic acids of the phosphatidic acid molecule. And now we have attached onto that phosphate group there in blue here. This is representing choline. Okay, and that entire molecule now is called phosphatidylcholine, basically. Okay, the phosphatidyl prefix tells us that we've got phosphatidic acid within the structure, and then it's just phosphatidylcholine because we've just attached a choline molecule onto the phosphatidic acid molecule. Okay, so this is what's also called lecithin or PC, and it is a major, major component of the phospholipid bile there. Okay, and you will see that it is a phospholipid. Again, okay, it's got uh, the phosphate group and the lipid molecules still in. Anything that's derived from phosphatidic acid uh, is going to uh, satisfy the criteria for being a phospholipid. Okay, let's also talk about the fact that all of these molecules that are derived from phosphatidic acid, such as phosphatidylcholine, are going to be polar molecules, okay, because we've, well, sorry, they're going to be amphipathic molecules, okay, because they've got the lipid groups here, which are incredibly hydrophobic, and then they've got this phosphate group here, which is polar, okay, it's better than just partial charges here, we've got a real negative charge, okay, uh, so that group is most definitely a polar molecule, basically. Okay, so uh, that makes the entire phosphatidylcholine molecule and indeed other derivatives of phosphatidic acid an amphipathic molecule. Okay, right. So we're not really going to draw this structure out that much. Okay, uh, what we will often represent phospholipids uh, with is a cartoon that looks like this. And this is a picture that people often draw to represent phospholipids. Okay. So, uh, basically, this ball at the head, this represents the polar portion of the molecule, okay? So we've discussed how this major example of a phospholipid that makes up the phospholipid by there, okay? And indeed other examples that you can come up with of phospholipids. This is not the only one, there are loads of other ones, uh, but they all obey the same sort of amphip amphipathic uh, features, okay? They have a polar group, which is the phosphate group, okay, at their head, okay, so this is the polar portion, and then generally they have two lipid groups, just like we've seen with phosphatidylcholine, okay, uh, which will be long-chain carboxylic acids stretching backwards or something very similar, okay, so two hydrophobic uh, tails like so. Okay, so this is how we're going to be representing uh, phospholipids throughout this video with this little picture here. And this is representing the polar phosphate group at the head of the molecule. And this is representing the two hydrophobic tails. Okay, and we can see how this picture um, tells us some truth about phosphatidylcholine. This is the polar group here at the head, okay? And uh, then we've got the hydrophobic tails stretching inwards. Okay, right, now we can go back to our picture of the cell membrane and we can see how phospholipids are arranged to build the phospholipid bilayer. So basically, the phospholipid bilayer is, as the name suggests, a bilayer of phospholipids. Okay, so here let me represent the phospholipids. So basically, if this is the outer portion of the cell membrane, so this is the extracellular fluid over here, okay, you have the polar heads of the phospholipid molecules facing out into the extracellular fluid where they will be interacting with water molecules in the extracellular fluid. And the hydrophobic tails are facing into the core of the phospholipid bilayer. Then on the other side, so this is the cytoplasm side of the membrane, so this is the cytosol, what you will have is phospholipids oriented the opposite way basically. Okay, so they, they have their polar heads facing into the cytoplasm here, and again they'll have their um, hydrophobic tails facing into the core of the phospholipid bilayer here. Okay, and that means that all the hydrophobic tails can interact nicely with one another. Okay, and they're protected, shielded from the water by this array of polar molecules, or polar groups rather, uh, that uh, face either out into the extracellular fluid or the cytoplasm.
Okay, so that's the structure of the cell membrane then. Okay, how does cholesterol fit in with all of this? Well, cholesterol is one of these core components of the phospholipid by there. Okay, it also integrates in with these phospholipids, okay, and it uses its amphipathic nature. Okay, so that polar group, that alcohol group, is the bit that's going to be facing out to either the extracellular fluid or into the cytoplasm. Okay, and the hydrophobic portion is then going to be uh, in the hydrophobic core of the phospholipid by there, interacting with the uh, hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids. Okay, so let me show you now how I'm going to represent a cholesterol molecule, basically. So, throughout this video, I'm often going to be representing cholesterol as a um, rectangle like so, to simplify it down so that I don't have to continue drawing uh, this larger picture. And again, I'll show the little flash of polarity by a purple dot there, so that's the alcohol group. And the rest of this hydrophobic structure here, I'll be representing in red like so. Okay, so that's representing my cholesterol molecule. This red portion is the huge, great uh, steroid structure, basically. Those four great um, neutral rings. Okay, and this little purple blob there is representing that polar group that will be facing out uh, to the extracellular fluid in this case. But I could draw another example, maybe down here, okay, where I'd have... Uh, the cholesterol molecule in the inner leaf that are the phospholipid by there, and therefore that polar group would be facing in towards the intracellular fluid here. Okay, right. So basically, cholesterol is a core component of all cell membranes, of all cells all around the body. Okay, so very, very important as part of the cell membrane. You need it there. Okay, now, you might say, well, why does that mean we need it in our diet? Because, you know, all of our cells will already have the cholesterol, why do we need any more? But remember, you have continuous cell division occurring in your body. So, for instance, at sites such as the skin, okay, and also the surface of the intestine, okay, you are continuously shedding cells, okay, your skin is continually being replaced, and the surface of your intestine is also continually being replaced. Skin cells are being shed off into the uh, environment, intestinal cells are being shed off into the uh, feces, okay, uh, so you need to continually be replacing skin cells and the lining of your intestine. That requires new cells to be being produced which requires more cell membrane, which therefore requires more cholesterol. So that's one of the great reasons why uh, you require cholesterol in your diet, because we are continually making new cells, okay? And these new cells are going to need cholesterol in their cell membranes. Okay, right. So we'll call it there for this video, and then in the next video what we'll talk about is the other major reason that you need cholesterol in your diet, which is that we use cholesterol for producing uh, bile salts.